Thank you, Gospel Sounds. I know some of you have been praying for our friend and congregational song leader, Jordan White, this week. She was scheduled to have her tonsils out midweek. You may know that she's really been having some trouble. And I want you to know that was a successful procedure for her, and she's back home in Louisville resting there and eating lots of ice cream. That was the last word I had from her. The pain's a little better. She's taking her meds, getting lots of ice cream. So we're grateful for that. I want to say a word of welcome to our guests and also to lots of folks who are back home. Uh, some have been away seeing loved ones uh, after a, a loss in your family. Uh, others have been away um, visiting uh, more southern locations. And so we're, we're glad that you're home uh, wherever you have been traveling and for however long we're glad you're home and it's always good uh, to worship together in the Lord's house. Uh, as Pastor Tim said a moment ago as he read uh, the scripture, we are in a series of sermons uh, called uh, Final Instructions. Final Instructions. Jesus' lessons from the upper room, Gethsemane, and the cross. That is to say, we're trying to pay close attention to those last-minute instructions, those last-minute messages that Jesus tried to pass along to his disciples and to other close followers. We've looked at several of these already, and today we find another in Matthew chapter 26. And in particular, we've been trying to pay attention to the fact that the culture at large Society at large has a set of values and beliefs and practices that push in on the Christian life. They begin to bend and influence and shape the way of Christ. And they begin to influence Christians to behave more like the culture and less and less like Jesus of Nazareth. And so through this sermon series, we're trying to make adjustments in our lives as we move closer to the cross. And as Pastor Tim said, sometimes that's in fits and starts. Sometimes it's one step closer to the cross and two steps back. But as we're attempting to move closer to the cross, we're trying to pay close attention to how we speak to one another. Trying to pay co close attention to the addiction to violence that's so pervasive in our culture today. And even pay attention to how the Last Supper is Jesus pushing back against the powers that are about to take his life. Rome and religious leaders may think that they're about to snuff Jesus out, but he takes symbols of his body and his blood to celebrate and almost to, to mock the powers that be and say, you may think you're about to win, but the love of God cannot be defeated. It knows no limits. It knows no bounds. It goes even beyond an instrument of torture, even beyond the grave to resurrection life. So for this morning's study, from Matthew chapter 26. The question I would ask you to entertain is this. Have you ever thought about your life as a journey? A journey. Or perhaps a better way to ask that question is, when you think of your life's journey, what images, what memories come to mind? Do you recall journeys uh, that you shared with your family as uh, a little one? Uh, do you remember uh, the great American road trip that your family made one summer? Do you remember favorite destinations? Are you like my family and vacation meant going to see grandmother over the mountains and through the woods? And the songs you sang and the games that you played and the stories that you told and the things you learned of your family through those journeys. Our spiritual journey can be tied to geographic locations, but our spiritual journey is also tied to other signposts that are not tied sometimes to specific locations. Sometimes our spiritual journey is tied to a memory of a season I went through when I was deep in sorrow, 
and yet the Lord met me there. Or a time when it, it seemed as though my witness just bubbled to the surface and it was so easy for me to share my faith. And yet that season has yielded to a different season in my life. Jesus gives us directions today in Matthew chapter 26. Directions to a new destination, a new location on our spiritual journey. And they're simple instructions with powerful impact. Sit here. Stay awake. Get up, Jesus says. If you've ever felt stuck in your faith journey, I hope you'll pay attention today. Or if you've ever desired to recapture a place you feel was lost or move to a new land in your life, I hope today's message is of comfort to you. The passage is in Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse 36. As I said last week, today we move to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus and his disciples have just left the Last Supper. They've just left the upper room, the place where they gather together. And Jesus reinterpreted the Passover meal and took the bread and the cup, speaking of it as his body that was to be broken, his blood that was to be shed from the new covenant. And when they reach the garden, I would encourage you to imagine that as a place that is much like an orchard in appearance. One olive tree after another, after another, row after row after row with lush vegetation. That's why we call this place Gethsemane, the garden. And in that place, with the angry mob that is about to arrest him, and turn him over to be executed only steps away. Jesus offers us three lessons on what it is to walk through life's journey with the Holy One. The first lesson is found in verse 36. Jesus says, sit here while I go over there and pray. He says something similar to a smaller group of disciples in verse 38. Stay here and stay awake. This idea that is sometimes called waiting on the Lord is a mysterious spiritual discipline that is mentioned several times in the Old Testament, most famously in Isaiah 40. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Isaiah picks up this topic another time in chapter 49. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. The psalmist Expounds on this idea in Psalm 33. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. And yet, although I'm familiar with the idea of waiting on the Lord in Scripture, I know that it is there. I can find those passages and reflect on them. It is still true that waiting on the Lord is so challenging. It is difficult for me. I find myself wrestling with the question, why would God ask me to sit and wait when there is so much yet to be done? Some of you may share in that difficulty. Waiting on the Lord may be hard for you, frustrating even at times. And yet there are moments, there are seasons in our life that are simply uncomfortable. They are simply not what we would choose for ourselves. And in response to those seasons, even through those seasons, despite the circumstances of those seasons, our God is working in our lives and in our world. The season of Lent itself can be uncomfortable. A season of reflection, meditation, sacrifice, focus, of stripping away the old and leaning toward the new of the cross and the empty tomb. It is easier to pretend that I'm ignoring the culture 
me easier to pretend that I can simply pull myself up by my bootstraps than it is to push back against the culture of violence in speech and in action. And yet this is a scriptural phenomenon going through these uncomfortable seasons. In the Old Testament, it was Moses. In the New Testament, Jesus went off into the wilderness for seasons of preparation. The Apostle Paul, after his Damascus Road experience, went off to a place that he calls Arabia, just over the mountains, to prepare and to go deeper into his new identity in Christ. Abraham was told to set out to a place and God would tell him he had arrived when he got there. You get frustrated when your GPS leaves you 200 yards away from your destination. How would you like to have directions that say, you'll know you've arrived when you get there? And Abraham sets out with his family. And yet in Scripture there are also seasons of difficulty that are not tied to a place or a physical journey. Esther. Ruth. Dealing with difficulties of what it is to be a woman in the single life. Hosea, dealing with marital infidelity. Mary, struggling with what happens to her reputation when Joseph and everyone else hear the scandalous news that she is expecting a child and yet is not married. It's impossible for us to know exactly what God is doing in these mysterious times. And yet one suggestion of what God is often up to in such moments as these is that he is asking us, God is asking us to be aware of the boundaries that exist in our lives. Peter Scazzaro has written a fantastic book called The Emotionally Healthy Church. It's a book that I'll be asking many of our leaders to take a look at in the next several months. He talks about some of these boundaries in our lives and says if we're not aware of these boundaries or if we think we are somehow superhuman and simply can overcome such boundaries, we will remain frustrated. It will be as if we are banging our heads against a brick wall because we are out of line with the boundaries that are the reality of our lives, such as our personality. There are simply certain limits that extroverts have. There are simply certain limits that introverts have. We have to recharge in certain ways. The season of life, he says, is a boundary for us. Those of us who are raising little ones have boundaries by their needs. Those of us who are caring for others in in severe health care need have certain boundaries in the caregiving role. Those of us who are struggling to get back to a place of financial health have certain boundaries that it would be irresponsible for us to go beyond. Schizero asks us to think about our life situation as a boundary. Those of us of one age are unable to do the things that we could do at one age and we're unable to do the things that we will be able to do again one day. the size and complexity of a household and the number of wage earners and so forth represent boundaries in our lives. He goes on to suggest we all have emotional and physical and intellectual boundaries that we simply cannot go beyond. And finally, he says, until we are aware of those scars from our past, indeed those open wounds from our past. Uh, We will not be able to understand just how deeply the past shapes the present. And until I'm able to deal with the scars, the wounds from the past, I'm not able to be aware of how I am continually living out day by day in reaction or in response to what happened years, even decades earlier. When we run up against these boundaries in life, it may just be that God is up to something far more than what we realize. Sit here. Stay awake. The second life lesson 
Jesus offers from Matthew 26. It's found in verse 41. Stay awake and pray, he says. Stay awake and pray. Or if I were to paraphrase, it's as if Jesus is saying, be ready. Be available. For when I, your God, decide that this season has played out long enough, when I decide that it is time to move to a new place, I will call upon you and let you know. So be ready. Be available when that season comes. Many of us, we might not say it this way, but in our feelings and in our actions, it is as if we believe that prayer is a lesser work. What Jesus seems to be saying in this second lesson today is that we need to understand just how active prayer truly is. A church that is not in prayer, a church that is not actively communicating with the holy will find itself adrift. And the same is true for a household. The same is true for an individual. Are you, are you watching for whatever it is that God has next for you? I want to mention to you today a spiritual discipline that is often referred to as silence and solitude. When I think about my life, it, it, it's a life full of noise. It's a life that, that tries very hard not to be in silence. The first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is start turning on electronic devices to fill my home with noise. The first thing I do when I walk into the office is select the music that I'm going to listen to. The first thing that I do when I get into the vehicle is turn on the radio. The first thing I do when I get home is turn on the television. Even when I sleep, there are little fans blowing white noise through my home. I can sometimes go days without being in silence. This is why some authors today argue that our generation, more than any other in the history of humanity, needs to learn again what it is to be silent in the presence of the holy. If you were somehow invited into the queen's presence at the palace, if you were somehow invited into the governor's residence, if you were sometime somehow invited into the Oval Office, it would not matter your politics. It would not matter your sense of policy. You would stand in silence out of respect for the office. And yet, when I pray, when I communicate with the Holy One, there is almost always noise in the room. Now some of you may say, oh, I, I, I just don't have the flexibility in my life to, to knock off for a month and go on an outward bound adventure and commune in the woods. I mean, I can't take a long weekend to go do one of these silent retreats down at Cedarmore. I just can't. You would be amazed at what a simple discipline of a one minute retreat could do for you. I know people that the first thing they do when they get to the office in the morning is to turn on the computer and then rather than reaching for a phone or an electronic device or a calendar or rushing to the coffee pot or the water cooler, they sit for a minute in silence before the Holy One. I know others that when they first pull up in the parking lot at work, after they turn off the radio, after they turn off the heater, after they turn off the ignition, they sit in the parking lot for one minute in silence before the Holy One. I know folks that before they rush out at midday for that all-important power lunch, that all-important working lunch, I have only so many of these a year and I better make them count. The leadership guru is right. Just after they call to confirm, they sit in silence at a workstation 
before the Holy One. I know folks who have the spiritual discipline and at the end of the day they go uh, to the washroom and they wash their hands slowly and deliberately in silence. Allowing the Holy One to cleanse away the hurt and the hate and the frustration and the frazzledness of the day. And when they dry their hands, they've disengaged and they can leave it there and go home to be with loved ones. I know folks who sit on their bed, on the edge of the bed at the end of the day, even after Uh, The light has gone out and before they're ready to lie down and go to sleep, they simply sit on the edge of the bed in silence for the Holy One for a moment, resting and listening even before they pray to give thanks for all that God has done that day. It doesn't matter who you are. You can make room for that type of spiritual discipline of silence and solitude in your life and it's out of that readiness that you may find yourself available when the Lord's call comes to you there's a third lesson Jesus offers in Gethsemane it's found in verse 46 get up Jesus says the time for something that we all can recognize as action has come Get up and let's go, Jesus says. But notice who is involved at each step along the way. Notice who is taking the lead in the action at every step along the way. Jesus says, I will go pray in the first step. In the second step, Jesus says, now you pray. And in the third step, Jesus says, finally, let's pray go together first it is Jesus who is at work secondly it is I who join in that work and thirdly we go and do this together do you hear the difference do you hear the contrast with the passage we read last week from Luke's gospel there they stand in the garden of Gethsemane and one of the disciples sees this band coming to arrest Jesus and draws a sword and asks, Lord, should we strike with the sword? And strikes. Do you hear the difference? Rather than Jesus in action, followed by me in action, followed by doing this together, it's all me. It's a rushing to the violent act that is more in concert with the way of the world than the way of the cross. Today's passage gives clear instruction of a way that is profoundly different than those who would lash out in violence, whether in word or in deed. And so this morning, before we move on, I'd like us to give this a try. A moment of solitude, a moment of silence. You may want to keep your eyes open. You may want to close your eyes. But I want to ask you to enter into a time of silence. Not just because most of us will be quite loud this afternoon from approximately 1 p.m. to approximately 3.15. But also... Because this is one of the disciplines that Jesus himself taught. And it was one of his final lessons. Something he thought was so important he went over it again in the moments before he was betrayed. So with your eyes closed or with your eyes open, I would encourage you to move into a time of taking very deep cleansing breaths. And imagine an emptying beginning in your toes, moving up through your ankles and your legs, through your torso to your shoulders, and finally, emptying of the mind. And a silent prayer, not to be followed by an endless stream of words, 
but instead a silent prayer that moves into a time of silence. And that silent prayer is, Lord, your servant is here. Would you pray that silently? Lord, your servant is here. And if your mind starts to wander, or if you begin to fill the moments with a stream of words, call yourself back to attention, back to silence in your spirit with that phrase, Lord, your servant is here. And after a moment of silence before the Lord, we'll continue in a different way. Lord, your servant is here. In just a few moments, our God can change our lives. In just a few moments, our God can reveal to us a spiritual practice that can be one of healing and restoration and a way that God directs our steps. It may be today that your response is simply to say, I will identify some places in my life where I can be in silence before the Holy One. Or it may be that even in these few seconds today, something has come together in your spirit and you recognize that there needs to be a response. Perhaps for you it is the response that says, now's the time for me to give my life to Jesus. My steps have been influenced by my own desires. They've been directed by this culture of violence. And I want to lay all of that aside and live my life in the way of Christ. If you're ready today to live for Jesus and to receive Him as Lord and Savior, then we want to give you an opportunity to make that decision public. And in just a moment, our musicians will lead us in a, in a time of song. And we would ask that you would come forward and share your decision with us. Or maybe, maybe you're one who, as, as, as we drew silent together, you moved very quickly past a sense of embarrassment that, that others around you might hear you breathing or, or shifting from side to side and and you moved into a sense of, of comfort that, that these are your people. And so your response today is, is to say, I need to be a member of this church. I need to join in these sisters and brothers in Christian fellowship and Christian mission. So if that's your decision today, won't you come and share that with us? It would be such a joy, such a privilege to receive you. Or perhaps... These moments were for you a culmination of something that God's been doing in your life. Uh, the Holy Spirit's been whispering to you and today you finally heard it in a way that was clear and, and you want to respond. 
you need to go deeper in, in service or you need to find a small group or you need to find a, a way that you can minister in this church or in the community. And, and so for you, you need to stay in a time of prayer or you need to come and share a desire to respond. However it is that the Holy One is directing you just now, we're going to stand and sing in hopes that you'll respond. Don't let these moments leave you. Don't try to dismiss what God is doing in your life. We stand now and sing in hopes that you'll come.